Welcome to the Bitcoin Show. Welcome. We're so happy to see you. I'm Bruce Wagner. And I'm Ed Gell. Today we have a really, really special show for you today. Um, we have Atlas and Adam from the Bitcoin.org forums here by popular demand. I have to admit, I mean, we'll talk about it in a minute, but um, I had actually never heard of these guys before, but what, where was I? I have no idea. Our mm -hmm. chat room is going, Atlas, Atlas, you gotta have Atlas. Uh, the only guest we want is Atlas. And I'm like, who is that? Okay, mm -hmm. I, gotta, I gotta research these guys. All right, so anyway, but I wanna, I wanna first say that today's episode is brought to you by our sponsors. We love dearly our sponsors because we wouldn't be here without them. Carpe VM, C-A-R-P-E-V-M.com. Video marketing, seizure market, say it with video. They'll help you create a video to market whatever you're gonna market. They're awesome. And Mezzi Grill, M-E-Z-E, -E, Grill. Mezzigrill.com, where authentic Mediterranean food meets modern flavor. All these guys accept Bitcoin, don't forget. And Tradehill.com, of course. Tradehill.com, where you buy and sell Bitcoins online with ease. And make sure you get 10% off your trades for life with the referral code TH-R141. It's on your screen, TH-R141, get 10% off for life of your account. And usgoldcoins.com, uh, Andy Gauss is our trusted advisor, literally, quite literally, for excellent investments in rare US gold and silver coins. Ed and I have been fans for a couple of years of Andy Gauss, and he happens to own this company. We, wouldn't, we highly recommend usgoldcoins.com, and ask for Andy and tell him Bruce and Ed sent you. So welcome to the Bitcoin Show, and welcome Atlas and Adam from via Skype. <laughs> Where are you guys? You're in two different locations, right? Mm -hmm. We like to refer ourselves as on the sovereign web. We are a sovereign entity, we like to think. The right, Adam? sovereign <laughs> web. I think it's very important to remain independent in this wild sea. Yeah, you just never know. Just like Satoshi, you know, people say, you know, all these theories about why Satoshi decided to be pretty, pretty much anonymous. And I say be the same reason that he created Bitcoin, because he's an intelligent guy. I mean, if I had created Bitcoin, I, I wouldn't be talking about it because you become a target. You just paint a target on your, on your back. So why do that? Why give people that opportunity? But you are very outspoken. I, um, I've heard your podcast that you've, you've just started, right? It's Bit Talk with two T's, B-I-T-T-A-L-K dot TV. Is that right? Right. That is correct. Okay. Um, we just go by the Bit Talk podcast. Um, I guess we could be labeled by our domain. Huh, Adam? <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. I think that uh, any way you want to get to us is fine, and we're going to be showing up more places. Cool. Um, yeah. So I listened to it because I had to do my research, and so I listened to uh, to your podcast a couple times actually to get a feel for uh, for you guys. And uh, I think you're doing a great job. Yes. Did you, this is just the first episode that you finished, right? Right. Mm -hmm. We plan to do another one this Wednesday, so stay tuned. Um, we plan, uh, we plan to do it like twice a week eventually. I don't know how Adam feels about that. <laughs> There's a... Yeah, exactly. I think that the, uh, the, the way we're playing this right now is we're starting off with what we got, which is once a week. We're aiming for releases on Saturdays, um, uh, recording on Fridays, and this week is a little bit special. Um, mm -hmm. But, uh, but, um, but well, yeah. <laughs> That's you know, yeah. I'm getting my wisdom teeth removed, so we can't do a podcast this Saturday because I'm just going to sound like I'm in pain or something. I don't know. <laughs> you can just talk like this, Bitcoin, 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 Bitcoin. <laughs> with, your, with all the gauze, I can just see it. Um, but, you know, as long as you're in silhouette, they won't notice. But, you know, the thing is that you'll probably have the same experience that we had. We decided we were going to do a month, no, a weekly uh, Bitcoin show. And uh, very quickly, we figured out that like about a half to a third to a half of the day, we're sitting around talking about Bitcoin all day anyway. And we thought, well, we may as well just do that. There's so much happening. Yes. When well, you're talking on the hacking front, the development, the, you know, the media attention, the, you know, Mt. Gox, the all, there's so many issues just swirling around at internet speed that it, there's a lot to talk about. I think you're going to find out that, you know, once a week, <laughs> you're going to have a hard well, time getting it in I think once a week. If we wanted to spend all day talking about Bitcoin, then that would be fine. But I think that, uh, that um, you know that Atlas and I have other projects in mind that uh, you know are, are on the media side for some of it, but that's not all of it. Right. Bitcoin right now is very appealing, I think, both from both from a uh, both from a currency property, but also from an entrepreneurial property. If you're an entrepreneur, then you know uh, trying to start something that's denominated in U.S. dollars right now in this current market is a very very difficult thing. But that's just not the case in Bitcoin. In Bitcoin, it is a land of opportunity. 
Mm -hmm. Right. And what we need is to inform these entrepreneurs, more business-like people who have the qualifications, so they can be starting up more businesses in Bitcoin. You know, right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because right, right now it's really just technical people, and you know, a lot of them have good business sense, but uh, a good portion of it is really lacking. I haven't seen a decent business plan on the forums, and very often. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it's not only hackers. I mean, it, ha it was that way originally, but actually, I know a lot of people. As soon as they see those charts of the values. There's a lot of Fred and Marge and Toledo crowd that just say, wait a minute, did I just double my money in one week? You know, it's like, whoa, it's waking up. And also a lot of hackers, mothers and fathers are being talked into taking out money from mm -hmm. their whatever, you know, their, their savings accounts or their 401ks or whatever they are and, and buying Bitcoin. So it's, it's, it is spreading for sure. Now, you guys well, are don't coders. Get me, don't get me wrong. I don't think that, yeah, no, I, I didn't mean to convey that uh, I thought that it was just hackers doing this because that's not the case. That, right. that does not describe me in the slightest. I'm very new, you know, um, uh, I'm very new to the Bitcoin community. Which one is I, me? You know, when you're saying me, are Bitcoin's about two weeks ago. Blue. So um, Adam is the one speaking. Yeah. Okay. So uh, Pardon? I'm sorry. I just want to clarify when you say me, who that was. So that's Adam. Yes, yeah, sorry, this is Adam. Okay. So you're yeah, saying you're new to the Bitcoin similar. community? <laughs> you're new to the Bitcoin community? Yeah, so I'm new to the Bitcoin community, actually. My background is uh, in a variety of things, but, uh, but I, I haven't... Uh, but I'm very new to this. I looked at it about six months ago initially mm -hmm. um, when I had an opportunity to kind of get into mining because I've always been involved in the game side of things, and so then you've got the processing power, and then it sort of makes sense to look at this stuff. But at the time, they weren't really worth anything, and I, you know, was really, really, really focused on silver and world economics. Mm -hmm. So, you know, passed it by. But now, now I see it's actually gotten over that first hurdle. Now we're into the second stage of this bull market. Okay. And I think it's a very exciting thing. And yeah, you can, I come from a similar position. When I first picked up Bitcoin, I had like over a thousand coins generated, but I deleted them all. <laughs> mm -hmm. Because I think it was going to be, become bigger than a technical toy, you know? Wow. So. Deleted. It, it, isn't that a weird thing, the, the thought of deleting your money? That's just so weird, isn't it? Mm -hmm. to think well, that but it's money money. now. It's money now. But I mean, you talk to somebody like it, silver's a great example. You know, silver was worth, what, $3 uh, 15 years ago? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, try to find someone to sell you silver for $15 now. It's not even conceivable. Right. But I guarantee they didn't delete any. So <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the truth of it. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why I avoided Bitcoin in the beginning, honestly, because this is not the first, you know, this is not the first uh, web-based digital currency to come out. Mm, it's right. just the first one to get past the hard part, <laughs> right. which is the part where it can die and then you lose everything, but it can cost you much. So that's okay as long as you didn't put everything into it. And we're still in the process of getting past that because, you know, obviously that has happened to a few people. So everybody's well, asking in the chat room is going crazy about JavaScript uh, mining. mining. What's the deal with JavaScript that? JavaScript mining? JavaScript? Yeah, to, in, in, what, in what context? Like I don't know. Like how you run on the website, Adam. Like how we tried on BitTalk TV, but a lot of people got angry because their CPU fans turned up when they tried to view our podcast. Well, it was on for 24 hours. Is that what they're talking about? Or are they asking about like the implications of what it's going to mean? Hmm. Oh, what's it going to... Well, you know, I'm asking for, I'm asking for Atlas forces visitors' computers to mine for him. So, I don't know, something about mining on your website that... Okay, yeah, this, this you can address if you want, or I can get it, Atlas. Uh, yeah, we tried it out, but it seems that a lot of users don't have sufficient CPU power to run the miner and watch the podcast, or it's just too annoying for them. So, we don't want to deny anyone access to our podcast based on on their hardware so yeah. we figure and we get enough donations right adam that justifies that alone i mean we only oh, got like oh so that's the thing is that you know i mean <laughs> bruce mm -hmm. as you said uh we just did our first episode and so the show has been in existence from conceptualization to now for all of what uh five days six uh -huh. days <laughs> okay yeah, <pretty> so, much. <laughs> so we've you know uh, we haven't really done anything conclusively because we really don't know what we're doing yet quite uh, quite all the way. Um, the reality though is that the cost to run something like this and to do it in a convincing and professional way is not very much. Mm -hmm. So really what we'd like to do is just uh, is to try to be a completely community supported uh, podcast and I think that's very doable. And so that was one of the models that we were looking at doing. Uh, the wow. concerns that we had with it of course was exactly what happened. Mm -hmm. Which is that you know? Which is that uh, people would get on, and so so. Anyways, I believe we've um, we've uh, switched it off entirely, and we have plans to possibly turn it back on, but have a default to being off. And if you want to contribute, then you can do that. Okay. But really, um, like I told you in the email, what we're trying to do is fund ourselves with nothing more than uh, 0 0.02 Bitcoin micro donations from listeners to like the show. We're gonna ask for that as a you know as a voluntary uh, as a voluntary uh, per episode uh, contribution. 
And that should be enough for us to provide a lot of services to the community, like transcripts and you know fresh art on everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, so so yeah, we're we're really uh, we're really excited about what Bitcoin enables us to do because it really lets us take the you know it, it lets us yeah never not before bow down to corporate master. Never okay. before could you accept donations less than a dollar. With Bitcoin, you now can. There's no middleman. There's no mm -hmm. one to take a little bit off of it. You know. <laughs> right. Well, okay, so you know the, the idea, this whole idea of um, having the website run JavaScript mining for you as a donation, that's, that, I didn't actually know anything about that until the chat room is just explaining now a little bit to me. So what you're saying, I, I want to make sure we, our viewers understand because I didn't, I didn't even know about this. So what you're, they're saying, I guess, and what you're saying is that when they, when they visit your website, then it actually runs their GPU and, and does mining that yeah. is actually creating Bitcoins for you guys? I believe no, that's not exactly correct. What okay. it actually does is, um, so there are a variety of ways that you can mine Bitcoins. You can mine them with CPUs, you can mine them with GPUs. Mm -hmm. So what someone came up with, this is not our script. We uh, took it from, you Do you have the link handy, Atlas? Yeah, it's bitcoinplus.org, I believe, or .com. Forgive me if I'm wrong, Bitcoin Plus. <laughs> yeah, Enjoy it's Bitcoin Plus either way. <laughs> um, so basically, uh, what that so that lets you install it, uh, install on your website, and run it as a Java um, app. Mm -hmm. And then what that does is it engages either an entire core or a part of a core, depending on what's available. And it's not your GPU; it's your CPU core. So okay. it I doesn't even much. Pardon? I believe GPU one, GPU ones exist, but our current browsers don't have the stuff built in. So maybe mm -hmm. one day we will see GPU accelerated miners on websites, and that will ease it up for a lot of users. But anyways, I'm going off tangent. Go on, Adam. <laughs> Okay. Oh yeah, well I mean that's that's basically it is that uh, you know is that for people you know like my computer I have I have a quad core and so if I'm sitting there then yeah you know it's fine for me because it doesn't really matter too much uh, if I'm devoting part or, or all of one core you know while I'm sitting there browsing but mm -hmm. if you've got a laptop you know or you're sitting on an older computer then that that's a real that's that's a problem uh, okay. and so I think that you know we're not the first site to use that software there are a couple others out there already and it's a really interesting way to start monetizing a property like this right. in a way that doesn't actually cost any of the listeners really anything once you figure out how to get it so it doesn't you know affect them because and how, right, right, that would be the thing the experience then it's no good how so do you find you out this, like how do you that? know that you're actually well, you're, they're on. using those CPUs wait a minute wait a minute wait a minute I have a question that's beyond the technical does the site explicitly ask permission to use the user's CPU to mine for you? It depends on your for, oh, right. it depends on your browser. Like if you're running Google Chrome, it'll yeah. ask you, do you want to run this JavaScript right when you get in the site? But I think most browsers, it just automatically starts running. Well, no, um, actually, I, I, went, I use really Chrome. Play. I'm sorry to interrupt. I use Chrome. I use Google Chrome. And I went to your site, and I listened to your podcast yesterday and today, and I didn't have any JavaScript pop-up that asked me anything. It's been turned off for the last two days. Oh. It was on for 24 hours on Saturday night, or uh, Friday night through Saturday morning. Okay. And we yeah. got some complaints about it, so I, you know, I gave people a direct link, and then I asked Atlas to remove it, and okay. we've removed it at this point. You know, I mean, yeah. it's, it, it, we're, we're trying things, is what we're doing. Yeah. You know, we're a new show, and so... Yeah. Well, I mean, I think yeah. that that's, that's, a, that's a, an innovative idea, as long as there's a pop-up or some sort of a, a, a front page that asks people's permission because I would not appreciate basically running software on my machine without my permission is could be considered malware that you know yeah it, absolutely neither would I frankly okay. uh, so yeah like I said what uh, if and when this does go back on on our site it's gonna default to off and it'll just be you know if you want to help out while you're listening to the show you can turn it on okay all right well yeah. it's off now and yeah I mean so you are going to give them a an option to opt in or opt out when they visit the site if you do implement it in the future Yes. Okay, yeah. yeah. I think but that's how important. I, but how I view that is that we might as well just start a bittalk TV, TV pool and we just <laughs> Yeah, there you go. Just come up with a pool, a pool yeah. of cool features, you know? Yeah. Like, a, like a while back, someone proposed the idea of a communist pool, which sounded like a fun idea where everyone gets equal <laughs> payout no matter what CPU you have. I mean, you have like a Pentium 2, you'll still get the same guy as like with a GPU mining on the pool, which he probably will quit pretty soon. Yeah. I, I think it'd be very fun for people with very little computing power. Mm -hmm. and it yeah. might work out, you know? It might not be very fun if you have a lot of computing power, but yeah, whatever. <laughs> it's a, yeah, right. They don't that have to join the party. As long as you're the guy with the least amount of power yeah. in the pool. <laughs> all God. the slow, slow, old old computers will will pool together and uh, they'll all get equal share. That sounds like an idea. I think I'm all about innovative ideas like that as long as it's, uh, I'm about transparency and honesty and being 
up front and saying, this is what we're doing. You know, if, if something were to run like that and it wasn't with my permission, I would probably be very upset. But if, as long as you're asking them, you know, if you're going to do this in the future, I know, I understand you're just starting out and it's an experiment. As, as long as it's very clear, do you agree to run this process on your machine in order to generate bitcoins as a donation, yes or no? Um, because you know, some people, it may affect their hardware, especially if they're on a, on a weak laptop or an old laptop or whatever. Um, it's really, it wouldn't be fair to, to do it without their permission. But let me ask you, there's... Um, yeah, they're people, saying here that it crashed my just, laptop uh, or something. There. We agree completely. Yeah. Okay, and what about the, uh, wait, as I've scrolled off now on my, it's Windows, unfortunately, I'm using here. Uh, but the, um, the, yeah, there it is, TF2, thanks, Satoshi G. Exchange. Um, CTF, C, uh, TF2, Decentralized Bitcoin Exchange, What's, what are your plans about using that? Tell us about that. Oh, that was an idea posted on the forums. The idea here, I told Adam about it last night, I don't know <laughs> what his current thoughts are, but basically... Team Fortress 2 is now a free game. Anyone can download the application Team Fortress 2 free. Mm -hmm. You don't have to pay for anything. Um, but basically, they have items within the game. Like, they have something called a key. And it's basically an in-game commodity. It mm -hmm. has inherent value that when you destroy it, you get like a random game, random or rare item in game. Mm -hmm. But you could also use it as a store of value and trade that for Bitcoins and vice versa without it being reversible. And that's one of the key features of it. You can't reverse transactions within if you were to trade through TF2 for bitcoins. Mm -hmm. So is it is it like a competing crypt, uh, digital currency or what, what's the? I don't understand the. Uh, it's it's not competing. It's not decentralized. It's all controlled by Valve. There is no there's no real Bitcoin theme going on with what Valve's doing with Team Fortress 2. It's just it's a good medium, a potential medium, because we have all these payment processors and they're all reversible and they all are tied to exactly being money. They want to collect a fee. Mm -hmm. Through Team Fortress 2, um, it's all up to the people, you know. Okay. <laughs> because you're trading an in-game item. You're trading one commodity for another. So basically it just lets them get their, their value out of Team Fortress 2 into Bitcoin and vice versa? Uh, it, even new people could use Team Fortress 2 as a paying process to figure out TF2. I guess if you are, were in TF2, you could theoretically sell your items for Bitcoin. It'd be cool to see a Bitcoin market for TF2 items, but mm -hmm. that's not really my gig. I'm not a big gamer anymore. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So well, let me give you my perspective on this, because we actually sure. did have a conversation about this last night. Please say your um, name, because we, we both, you, actually your voices sound so similar. T tell us your name when you say my perspective. Uh, so this is uh, Adam. Adam, okay, gotcha. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so uh, basically, uh, I, I didn't really understand the idea at first when Atlas pitched it to me, and what the conclusion, uh, you know, what what I came to realize is that what he's saying is that this is an easy way to buy in. Right now, when I went to fund an account, you know, I had to go through uh, through a payment processor who then got me into Liberty Reserve, and then I had to transfer my Liberty Reserve over to uh, one of the uh, various exchanges, you know, and then once you're into the system and into Bitcoins, then it's a lot easier. But getting that initial Getting that initial uh, foot in the door is, is actually pretty difficult. So uh, these keys, as I understand it, Atlas, are actually sold by Valve, right? Right, right. So it depends okay, on... So Valve already sells them $4. So oh, it, I'm getting that. Exactly. Now that so, picture so, is so, coming. So you, you can buy it so with a credit card? So basically you're paying into... Basically, essentially, you're getting Steam dollars. Mm -hmm. You're turning Steam dollars into... Uh, into bitcoins, but in order well, they're to they're not really dollars. They're not really dollars. Uh, I, I disagree with you on, on the fact that they're money, but I think that it is a. Sh it is money. Numbers. It's in money in the in-game economy. You can use it to trade for other items within the. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, in the same yeah. way that Bitcoin was a year and a half ago. <clears throat> so yeah. <laughs> let me make sure I understand this. So you can actually buy these value things um, from Steam, like with a credit card, Mastercard, Visa, or something like that. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh huh. And then you can take those and exchange them for Bitcoin right on the spot. Yes. If somebody makes a market, and that's what Atlas is uh, is talking about doing. So okay. So be, so the end result is that you can buy Bitcoin with Mastercard or Visa. Yes. Exactly. It would take, <laughs> you know, that sort of process because because both the key transaction. So so once you buy it, okay. Mm -hmm. So you buy it with the credit card, and then you have these keys. Mm -hmm. The keys. Once you go to trade them for Bitcoins, mm -hmm. that transaction happens instantaneously. Okay, mm -hmm. so then the Bitcoin transaction also happens instantaneously. Right, that is radically different than any other option to fund on the market right now. You know, you can do a wire transfer and it'll take you know between one and only four days, depending on where you're going to. Right. You can try to do a credit card, but I mean, there you know, and then it's a, there's a, it's a good shortcut. And then there's a the problem okay. with the keys though. Like, how do I turn my Steam uh, this item into actual dollars again? 
and there's a whole bunch, there's a huge community, 70,000 people playing Team Fortress 2. And if you sell a key for less than what Valve's selling for at least like 10 cents, it's instantly US dollars pretty much. You either, so I guess there is an obstacle there because you probably have to accept PayPal or something for that key. But uh, mm -hmm. since you can't reverse the, um, I guess that comes, there's another issue there. Well, you can always but sell like the Bitcoins. It makes it easy to get in. Getting out, yeah. that's a different question. I mean, yeah. selling, the, actually getting out is easy anyway. You can sell Bitcoins on Trade Hill and, yeah, and get it deposited market. right into your bank account. There's a lot of ways to sell Bitcoin, uh, even through BTC near me and just sell them outright for cash to somebody in your neighborhood. There, I think it's easier to get uh, cash. First of all, why would you want dollars out? But if you did, I think it's a lot easier to get dollars out of Bitcoin than it is to, to get to buy Bitcoin with cash or in this case, credit cards. So is it, so let me, when this is all, is this actually functioning right now? No. Uh, it's, all, it's, it's all on paper right okay. now. I mean, what it would all take for me to do is create a TF2 server, mm -hmm. which it would be at the, like a low power, so it's like $3 a month. Mm -hmm. And I just write some uh, scripts in there using source mod. And yeah, I would be running instantly, and it's all dependent on people willing to join that server on Team Fortress 2 and start trading Bitcoins for TF2 items. <laughs> mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it, I, I guess I could easily start it up, or someone else could take this idea and start it up themselves. Mm -hmm. But um, do you I have to? So you, in order to set this up, would you have to be set up? Your entity would have to be set up as a Mastercard Visa merchant. No, not at oh. all. That's all taken care of on Valve's side. All, okay. Valve takes care of all of that. And, okay. and there's people concerned like, huh, Valve may not like you using their game as a trading marketplace, mm -hmm. but the thing is Valve has everything to gain from this. People yeah. are just gonna, if this takes off, people are just gonna be buying from Valve's store like crazy. And they'll mm -hmm. just be like, oh, we see no problem with this. I'm getting, oh, we're just, they're getting a bunch of 250 in transactions. As much people, as many people want to buy Bitcoins, they will get profit from it, you know? Right, yeah. <laughs> and what's the and, user and base? Enough, the exchange rate is actually set officially by Valve. Wow. So, it, it's, so it's a fixed exchange rate because these keys don't change price. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's $2.50 for a key. So how many keys would you need for a Bitcoin right now? Like um, six or seven. Yeah. Uh, so six or seven Valve keys will get you a Bitcoin. If so basically the Valve right. key is take, pegged to the dollar. It's just at two and a half for a dollar. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And what's the user base on this game, and how big is the economy? Do you have any idea? Uh, the economy yeah. on this game for the games is huge. Like way back when, when they first started this up, people were selling virtual hats. They put on your character for like ten thousand. Mm -hmm. Well, not ten thousand, but like hundreds of thousands of dollars. And these people will get like tens of thousands of dollars in profits because of it. Mm -hmm. and it, it was oh, mad, wow. and it's it's dying down a little bit. It's kind of uh, stabilizing right now, but the economy is just getting bigger and bigger now that the game is free to play. So. It, it has a lot of similarities to Bitcoin, except it's just cosmetic items with no real <laughs> mm -hmm. use. But right, and so, at the end of the day, there is a centralized control, which right. is helps. Yes, which kind of helps because then they can deal with the Mastercard Visa nonsense. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. You know, I mean, distributed systems are incredibly robust and incredibly strong, but they do have that problem of if you, if you mm. need to interface with the real world, which right now is not us, right. Uh, right. then you, you got to jump through hoops. So, so that would be a shortcut for that. Right. Okay. So, um, yeah, when, yeah, yeah, the chat room is asking, did Bruce just say, uh, centralization is, uh, helps. Yeah, it does. If you're dealing, if you have a big company, a big corporate, uh, entity and you're dealing with MasterCard and Visa, they have teams of lawyers who can fight for their merchant account to uh, defend it with the banks because they're all part of the same club. But, uh, if you as an individual set up a merchant account trying to accept MasterCard Visa for Bitcoin, they're going to yank your account pretty fast. Yeah. So that kind of does help. Um, as long as they allow you to set up this exchange. Now, would it be, is your idea that it wouldn't necessarily, the user could use it almost transparently without actually having anything to do with the game. They could just basically put in their MasterCard Visa and buy Bitcoin. Or... Uh well, all Valve sees is that you bought a virtual item from them. Um, I mean, Valve doesn't really care what servers you set up. I mean, there's like freaking uh, furry and pornography servers on the TF2 <laughs> game. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, it, they don't really care as much content-wise. It, what's actually decentralized is the servers users can set up. Mm -hmm. So, um, Okay. And yeah. so are you, are you planning to actually set up this uh, exchange? Um, I'm tempted now that we're now talking about it on air. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's yeah, really exactly. not that... It's really not that hard, you know. Mm -hmm. All I need is about three dollars a month to set up like a VPS, really cheap VPS, and uh, if people can really probably set up the rest if they really wanted to. So, mm -hmm. um, well, this, you want to set this up? Then you know, I mean, we can definitely go set it up. We, I, Bruce, we just started talking about this last night. Wow, really? 
Yeah. yeah. Oh my gosh. There are all these, the, the, you have fans who are following your every word <laughs> because they're in the chat room. They're all about it. They mm -hmm. want to know, um, and this is from them. They're asking, you know, feel free to not answer if you want, but they're asking about, you know, if you are of legal age and if not, if that is going to, it would affect your ability to, you know, to, to deal with uh, whatever banking issues there are in, in operating an exchange. Uh, if I was uh, not of age, it wouldn't be an issue. I have ways to get around it. Um, <laughs> okay. uh, uh, if you really want to set this up, you could donate some Bitcoins to our podcast TV, um, mm -hmm. uh, bittalk.tv donation address, mm -hmm. and I'll use that towards Kaylee Host, and I'll set up a server tonight if you really want. Wow. Uh, so, <laughs> now, uh, Bruce, were you, asking about, um, were you asking about sort of the larger implications of that? Um, what do you mean? Explain. <laughs> the larger. Well, I mean, um, well, I, I, I think the that, question, uh, I guess, is did Atlas, did Atlas answer your question completely? Oh, I'm not sure. The chat room was asking, you know, if, uh, I guess it's not clear if you guys are of legal age and if that even makes any difference okay, at okay. all when you're operating um, an exchange. Uh, Atlas, I'm not sure if you want to disclose. But I am of legal age. I'm, you know, I'm married and, you know, I've <laughs> been around for a while. Okay. <laughs> all right. Mm -hmm. So... That's cool. And so tell me, what is it that you're, um, this is an idea that you just came up with and uh, you may or may not decide to do it. What, what is it that you, uh, what's your primary occupation? What fills most of your time right now, both of you? As for me, um, you know, I'll just go ahead and disclose. I'm a student, all right? So mm -hmm. um, my occupation right now is just writing down business plans that I would like to act on in the future. Um, I read a lot. I just educate myself. Um, Adam probably doesn't want to disclose anything. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. I can tell you that uh, I've spent the last pretty much two years, uh, you know, spending somewhere between 14 and 18 hours a day trying to understand what's going on with our world. Mm -hmm. And I think about six months ago, I actually started to kind of figure it out, and sort of started to make sense. And so mm -hmm. now this is what makes sense to do. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the, what's the reason behind your anonymity? Uh, the anonymity is that we want to keep our options open in terms of what we can talk about and what we can say. And once you start attaching a name to it and start attaching a real life identity to it, that gets much more difficult. I, I you know, I, I think it's very brave um, of what you guys are doing as far as you know being out there and uh, up front with your IDs. But I think that there's there's a real scenario here where the government is going to come in and start to start to cause problems for us. And personally, I like my life. And I, yeah. I mean, yeah, well, Bitcoin is a very revolutionary idea. People mm -hmm. like to think otherwise, but it, it has, it, from its start, from Satoshi, it's a very libertarian, very anti-government idea. <laughs> mm -hmm. So you may disagree with us, but... Well, I mean, no, it, not at all. The way I, I mean, it is a revolutionary idea, of course, but I feel pretty safe as a journalist because if, if I'm in trouble reporting about Bitcoin, then so is... Forbes, Fortune, Business Week, Wall Street Journal, everybody that's interviewed me this week, Al Jazeera, English, and so on. So, like, everybody's in no, trouble so because everybody's talking about it. Yeah, well, we're, yeah, we're telling the <laughs> truth. I mean, they, they are, too, mostly. I mean, I, I was really bashing them the other day, the, the two or three articles that came out recently. But for the most part, they're doing pretty well. The Economist had a great article. New York Observer had, uh, has a, had a couple great articles. So, I mean, yeah, uh, it's, talking it's about it, I think it's okay. right now. Sorry? That's what it is right now. Right now, it's a speculative bubble. Right now, that's how the world is viewing it. And so, you know, you mm -hmm. and I know that's not really true. The fundamentals say that this thing, you know, has legs and it's mm -hmm. just getting started, not ending. Yeah. Yeah. So, right. you know, I mean, I mean, once people start really working and doing business with this thing, once it reaches like over a late, at least like, how, how, much, how big is the Bitcoin economy right now? How many, how many US dollars are in the Bitcoins right now? Do you recall, Adam? Uh, uh, I don't off I think it's six point seven million times seventeen dollars or so. I don't know how much that is, but it's a lot. It's a lot and yeah. growing as well, the value well, goes see, up. See, you say that's a lot, but that's that's actually an incredibly small amount. I mean, if you look at it relative to any other sort of financial markets out there, that's you know that's a day's worth of losses on a good day. Yeah. Right. So, you know, I mean. Yeah, once we start taking away from major industries in terms of Bitcoin economy, we'll start seeing some uh, uproar. I'm pretty confident we will. <laughs> well, I, I have to tell you one thing. The fact that I'm here and the fact that I'm interested in this means that we've, we've exited that first phase, means that we are at the, we, we've exited the part where nobody knows about it and nobody's ever heard of it and it's just some hacker thing, but we have to get enter the part where we start seeing that steady climb up. Mm -hmm. I, I think, think so, so too. I think I think that this is just the ground floor. 
I always say we're not even on the ground floor. We're like in the basement, two steps up. And the, well, when this really the, hits, the thing is, I disagree with you there. I think this is the ground floor. I think before you were in the basement, and now we are on floor one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of media attention yeah. right now, but I think that it's 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 hitting the media. People are finding out about it. But as far as the buying of Bitcoin and the actual use of Bitcoin, I think we're we're not at the ground floor yet. When it, we will we will be when you can go, at, you know, to many places and buy a cup of coffee with Bitcoin, and also when like half the people you know have money in Bitcoin in the form of Bitcoin. Just like right now, how many people you know use PayPal? And that, when that same percentage of people use Bitcoin, then I think we'll be at the ground floor of, of something really, I mean, we're already something really huge, but what I mean is the value is gonna go up. When you talk about the Bitcoin economy, if the value of a Bitcoin goes to $600 a Bitcoin, for example, well, look at, look at what the total economy is then. Then it's 600 times 10 million Bitcoin or whatever it is. So, you know, it's, it's gonna, as the value goes exponentially up, so does the total economy. Right, but, there, but what's going what's gonna to be the big driving factor for how fast we see that sort of climb? You, I, I believe that you, um, I heard you made a prediction about $100 by the end of July, is that right? Yeah, I said <laughs> something like that. $100 by the end of the month and, and yeah, 10000 I actually made it 10000 a Bitcoin within a year is what I said. But who knows, I, know, I, pulling that I out of the air. I think that's a, that's a real brave and a very difficult statement to make because uh, there are so many variables here that, that, are, that are coming into play. Yep. That's what they said when I said it would reach a dollar. I told Ed, you know, it was 20 cents or something when we, when we first got into it. And I said, this is going to reach a dollar a Bitcoin. <laughs> and he said, yeah, maybe in two or three years. And I said, no, 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 it's going to be two or three months. <laughs> but of course, we were both wrong. It was actually two or three weeks. So, you know, it was like really fast. And then when it hit a dollar, I was like, this is going to reach $10 and so on. So it, we just keep, uh, you know, I keep making these predictions. And so far, I've been right. I said, what was it? I, uh, was it June 1st? I said it'll be $10, $10 by the end of May or something. And actually, the, by, the, by midnight and June 1st, it was 9.999. So. But the money's got to come from somewhere is what it comes back to. The money has and what, to come from somewhere. Well, and it's going to get money into it. Everybody who doesn't own it. If, if, if this really is a world currency, to get into it is like it's going to have to use, go into some major industry. Like uh, the Pirate Bay founder, he made an article and he says it has a very good use for international trading with all these. Um, what I forget what kind of companies, but it has to hit something like that. It's mm -hmm. not going to just come from people like you and me who just want to buy coffee with this stuff. I mean, it would have to be very massive for that to happen. And I find it very doubtful that's going to happen because the central <laughs> banks, the government, they're very good at censoring the media, the general media out there. And they'll get it out of general media if they can. Yeah, but so, so far they're not very good at, inter at, at, at censoring the internet. Right, and exactly. we're, the internet really is the new media. But people that I talk to say, I can't remember the last time I watched actually old media that every, all my information I get off the internet. So they're watching us, they're watching new media and they're learning. I mean, every, kids, kids, I say, you know, 20, 20 to 30 year olds are actually getting most of their information from Google video and YouTube. I mean, they're, you know, we're really getting our information from the internet now. And, you know, it's, I think that the government's not very good at censoring the internet yet. And hopefully they never will be. It, you know, we're ahead of the curve because we're, you know, the younger generation is up on this technology, and, and the, the internet is the, the equalizer, and, and it promotes free speech. Well, the question is, will the majority get their information from the internet? Does the majority get their information from the internet right now? Because what I'm seeing now is a bunch of people who just spit out what they see on Fox News, CNN, or whatever. You know, whether it's, it's a majority or not is largely irrelevant. I mean, I mean, yes. that's, that's the reality of it. Is that it? We don't need, you know, I mean, look at something like the American Revolution. When the American Revolution started, something like 13% of, of the actual population was in favor of the revolution. But they did it anyway. Right. So, I mean, so, so to get these things started, you don't need... As a start of the grass magical roots. about 51%. <laughs> That's true. I There's see. a tipping point. And also, yeah, exactly. you know, it's the exactly. influencers. Life is all about thresholds. It's really what it comes down to. Uh, yes. You know, life's about a lot of things, but it's about thresholds. And so the question is, you know, if your neighbor... Yeah, has bitcoins and asks you, you know, do you do have bitcoins? Then maybe that's weird. But if five of your neighbors on your street all say that, then is that still weird? You mm -hmm. know, I mean, at, at what point does it become normal? What's your threshold for? Okay, well, I guess this is happening, so I'll do it. Right. You know. And you know, the other thing is that that it's not just how many. It's not just the number of people that are into Bitcoin or aware of it or getting their information from the web. It's who the influencers, because in every family, you know, in your extended family. There's, uh, you know, our nephew, Jonathan. Jonathan is the geek. He's the computer guy. You want to know what kind of phone to buy? Ask Jonathan. You want to know what kind of computer to buy? Ask Jonathan. 
And Jonathan is going to the family picnic and he's talking about Bitcoin, 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 Bitcoin. And he's talking his parents into investing in Bitcoin. So there's that. It's, it's not just, it's like a demographic and advertising. It's not just how many people, it's the influencers. When it comes to technology and innovation and things new, it's the younger generation that is actually influencing all the older people. Mm -hmm. and the other thing I wanted to say is that the, um, what was the other thing I wanted to say? Darn it, I lost it. Uh, <laughs> I got something uh, go to ahead. say too, Atlas. You want to go first? Go ahead. Yeah, but how effective is the influence? Because look, frankly, I've told my grandparents, my parents, my teachers all about it. And so far, they think it's play money. Mm. <laughs> Maybe I didn't go do a good job of convincing them, but the older generation, are they truly receptive to this new influence? Or will mm. they truly open it up to little Johnny's uh, new Bitcoins? Uh, <laughs> in my experience, they've been very receptive. Like mm. I, I know 60-year-olds and 70-year-olds who are putting a, thousands and thousands of dollars. Oh, I know what I was going to say. The other thing. Um, when they see the growth, they're just like, they, they, they have nothing to lose. You know, just, you know, for us, what might be 20, 20 or $30 might be 20 or $30,000 for somebody who has a lot of money. So they can just throw some pocket change in and see what happens. And then it, it doubles right, exactly. and triples. Exactly. You know, you know and that's, that's, that's been kind of my experience too, is that the influencers certainly, you know, like I, I recently was finally able to convince my, uh, my parents to, uh, to put some money into something besides dollars. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, Shoot, I just forgot what I was gonna say. <laughs> oh, I remembered what I was gonna say. Where does like this is like amnesia <laughs> is contagious. But here's the thing that I was gonna say is that I've heard people talking about creating some sort of a fund that's tied to the value of Bitcoin. If they were able to create some kind of a fund, I'm really not sure if that's if that would be a good thing or a bad thing. But one thing I know, if there was some side, sort of a fund that was traded on the stock market that was actually tied to the value of Bitcoin, imagine if institutional investors like General Electric or something decided to put money into this fund because it was so profitable and they were buying Bitcoin. Now you're talking about millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars for one investor, that's mm -hmm. gonna really change. Well, they're everything. already looking at it yeah. that we know of. I mean, we can't disclose any names, but uh, just from people telling us, there's definitely big hitters that are vying or looking at Bitcoin mm -hmm. for sure. It's just a matter right, of you know, it makes sense. getting that critical mass. Mm -hmm. An exchange traded fund indexed to Bitcoin. So the um, the chat room is asking something about a private army. What what is that? <laughs> what are they talking about? I don't. Oh, that was like a single post. You know, there's uh -oh. a big these single posts troll. will get you in trouble every time. And there was a what big was it? troll flood like way back when. You know, before we had the newbie board. Mm -hmm. And I just got and someone asked like, what would you do with your if you had a million bitcoins? I answered, well. I, I would like to get a private army and set up a sovereign <laughs> island somewhere with that, oh. you know, open up the private army for the highest moral bidder, you know, encourage liberty, give everyone the power to hire an army on an mm -hmm. individual level, mm -hmm. get rid of the monopoly on armies. <laughs> so anybody uh, can have their own so, army. So, really. uh, so that scared a lot of people, apparently. <laughs> I guess it is a very controversial idea. Um, but I, I don't, I probably, there probably are some flaws in my idea mm -hmm. and it's, uh, actual a ability to mm -hmm. start and it's viability, but <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not I very big. You know, go on, go both, on. You go, both Atlas and I view ourselves as anarcho-capitalists. Mm -hmm. So what, uh, are, are you familiar with that term? No, but I, really. I know anarchy and I know capitalism, so how, okay. how do they okay, so, so anarcho-capitalism isn't actually what it sounds like. It sounds like, oh, craziness, you know, anarchy, but there's also some capitalism, but, but it's not actually <laughs> um, Anarcho-capitalism is capitalism where when you ask the question, who's in charge, the answer is no one. Mm -hmm. Like Bitcoin. So, so what you wind up with, now this is a system we've never really had uh, in, in our lifetimes, but you know, if you look back historically, it's actually happened a couple of times. And in general, it's pretty good. You know, the, the reality is, is that you only need things like, you know, there are some regulations you need, but you only need most of the government intervention when you have monopolies. And the only way that you get monopolies is when government enables monopolies to happen by right. making regulations. And the government itself is a monopoly on guns. <laughs> right, exactly. Well, the government yeah. itself is a monopoly on a variety of a things. A lot of things, yeah. Monopoly on governance. So, mm -hmm. so uh, the, the question is, um, so the question is, what should the government do and what should be available for private citizens? And so mm -hmm. if you, you know, have all this money and want to make an army, then that's fine. But you should use it to defend yourself, not to go attack people. You attack people, then you know you're disrupting the community and then other people are encouraged to get together, uh, pool their money, uh, pool their resources, form their own army. And because you don't have this taxing authority that's taking all of the money from the people and then using it to fund the army that works against them, 
And I'm gonna I'm gonna save this. And how this ties with Bitcoin is that you, people, regular people like you and I, could anonymously fund things such as a private army um, without being stopped. You know, corporations, entities, groups, they could fu put money towards this without having a trace. You know, and previously that could be stopped at the source, the funding, because the money is now currently centralized. Mm -hmm. But with Bitcoin, that changes everything. And mm -hmm. you really think that that would be a better a better country if everybody had their own army? No. What? No. no. N but the question is, do you think it's a better army when nobody can have their own army except the government? Well, basically, you're talking about the right to bear arms and to defend yourself, it sounds like. And basically, I'm talking about freedom in general. Basically, I'm talking about what is the default standard. Can you do something or do you have to ask permission? Mm -hmm. I think the world that we were intended to live in and the world that our founders created for us in this country was one where we did not have to ask permission to go and do normal shit. You know, that's, that's a very <laughs> new thing this last mm -hmm. 80 years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's about well, I, I, tell you, I tell you what. Um, I understand that this sounds a little bit on fringe, but if you go and you read about monetary history, uh, specifically, <laughs> specifically a book like you know the Creature from Jekyll Island by Edward uh, Edward, uh, what the heck's it called? Edward uh, G. Griffin. Mm -hmm. um, that's a really good place to start. There are a mm -hmm. lot of other things out there, and also if you want to learn more about anarcho-capitalism from economists who've actually thought these things through and have you know put together how it would work with security and you know how you would do government in a in, in, a, in a free society, I mean a truly free society, which is very much not what we have right now, mm -hmm. then you can, uh, you can take a look on YouTube uh, and uh, just search for the Mises Institute. I can link you to a couple of good videos if you'd like. Mm -hmm. But this is, this is how Bitcoin ties into this, that Bitcoin enables these kinds of societies because eventually if everyone puts their wealth in Bitcoin, there's not going to be any tax authority, you know? Mm -hmm. And if there's no taxes, you don't have monopolies like uh, Odibius. What's the name of the term, the debt you're talking about? Mm -hmm. the, uh, odious uh, debt. Yeah. Odious debt. You don't have them stealing from you. So so they can continue to coerce you. And that cycle kind of abrupts when the funding is all in a decentralized currency, you know? So um, people will say this is wrong. There will still be centralized banks and such. People won't go totally into Bitcoin, but um, we just have but to they wait. They don't and have see. to. That's not the point. The point is to break the monopoly that we have right now, which is dollars. The, mon the dollar monopoly is the most destructive thing that the world has ever goddamn seen. Hmm. <laughs> you know? yeah. Yeah, and I, and I wonder if it's really not the government that's behind that. It's the, the world bankers who actually oh, own corporatology. Yeah, I, you know, we could go into that yeah. thing if you want, but I think it's much easier to it's much easier to understand these problems if you look at what's happening rather than you know <laughs> rather than who exactly is doing it. Because once you get into mm -hmm. the who is doing it on the on the meta scale, then that's very controversial. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it, it, just just to mention, this is exactly why we're we're appearing as silhouettes on this show. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> because this sort of talk is not really that popular. No, not well. It's not. It's 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 on the fringe. It's not mainstream, yeah. right? There's a lot of people. I mean, it's they're they're political um, views that. Um, can, I don't know, overlap with the idea well, of Bitcoin, but not necessarily yeah, you know, shared by the, the masses. The bottom line is, is that anything you say that has the, the net result of saying, you know, anytime you transact in United States legal tender, you are being robbed. That is what is happening. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Yeah, well, that's true. And also, um, but you know, so anyway, but yeah, these obviously armies are often associated with attacking, not just defending. And so, right. you know, especially individuals. Let me, it's let me more, say, it's I really more about freedom. Philosophy is atomized, it's non aggression principle. We do not initiate force unless we're initiated against. Does right. that agree? Right. Yeah, <laughs> okay. no, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, really, I think that's what most. Uh, what most libertarians, you know, or people who identify with this sort of freedom, freedom element want is just to be left the fuck alone. You know, I mean, I've tried to start several businesses and I've had some success and I've had a lot of failures. And the failures have been every single time largely due to the sheer amount of paperwork that's required. I, I work out of California. So, I mean, so you can imagine how much regulation, red tape, nonsense we have to start, uh, do you go through to start anything. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, you know, it's bad here, but it's bad everywhere. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, yeah. it still affects the Bitcoin too, because I just tried to start a uh, resale business, reselling socks and underwear for Bitcoins. Mm -hmm. And I had to wait in the mail for two to three weeks for a resale certificate, still as it came in, you know? So <laughs> that's mm -hmm. just a purchase from the manufacturer. And so there's still a lot of red tape. and. Right, to give you permission to sell used socks and underwear for a commodity. Yeah. Well, not used, but yeah, sell. What is the problem with that? Why does that need a license? Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. Yeah, we, and, I think I agree with you. As far as the freedom, absolutely, I agree with that. Yeah, anyways, Defense, we can get back to Bitcoin. You, know. you, can, uh, Coin, you can tell that I'm pretty passionate about this particular topic. Yes, yeah. for sure. Let me take a break really quick because we got to get this in. We have 
so many things to talk about. But I do want to, again, thank our sponsors. Obviously, none of us would be here without them. Um, they accept Bitcoin. They support you. They support the Bitcoin community. The Bitcoin, really, it's a Bitcoin movement. And CarpeVM is C-A-R-P-E-V-M dot com. CarpeVM will create a video for your website that will help really present your product or service in the most professional way and sell what it is that you're selling. Seize your market, say it with video, carpevm.com. Contact them, Charlie over there, thank them for sponsoring Only One TV and The Bitcoin Show, and Mezzi Grill, the world's first restaurant, as, as far as we know, that accepts Bitcoin. Right here in Midtown Manhattan, just a few blocks south of Columbus Circle, if you're living in New York or if you're passing through New York, who doesn't pass through New York sooner or later, stop in and pay, 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 pay for breakfast, lunch, or dinner at Mezzi Grill with your Bitcoins. It's just the coolest thing to be able to scan that QR code and pay for your lunch with, with Bitcoin. Mezzi Grill is M-E-Z-E grill.com. Check it out. Authentic Mediterranean food meets modern flavor, and it's one of our favorite places to eat. Um, and also Trade Hill, of course, tradehill.com. That's the place to buy Bitcoins online with convenience. They have more and more uh, ways to get money in and to get money out quicker and, and efficiently. Uh, they're bringing it up online. They're, they're dealing with this overwhelming demand for people to, to buy and sell Bitcoin online. You get 10% off your trades for life and support the Bitcoin show and only one TV and the Spanish language El Show to Bitcoin by using the referral code TH-R141. That's TH-R141. And also usgoldcoins.com, our trusted advisor for excellent investments. And, and if you want to diversify, you don't want to hold all your eggs in one basket, um, check out one of the most, one of the, the best investments there are, second maybe to Bitcoin or maybe on a par with Bitcoin, is rare gold and silver coins because they hold their value both numismatically, which means because they are rare collector's items and because they're gold and silver. So because of the precious metal and the rare, uh, the rareness of the actual coin, they hold their value two ways. Andy Gauss, our most trusted advisor, usgoldcoins.com. We thank them. <clears throat> so, um, so I wanted to find out about Atlas. Uh, what is the adoration of uh, your fans on the on the forum, like what's that all about? All all the uh, people, I, I don't. You have I, a lot I of fans. I'm a, I guess I just stick out. I don't understand it all too much. <laughs> you know? you what have you contributed that everyone you know really likes what you have to say? <laughs> well, I'm glad. I'm glad they derive pleasure from my presence. <laughs> <laughs> do you do you hang out on the forum all the time? Are you uh, addicted? I guess I. I do spend a good amount of time on there. I have about 1,500 posts, which is a good large amount. Wow. So I, I've been doing forums for a very long time, so I guess I just built up a, a persona. I guess I'm just very passionate about what I talk about, you know, now, so. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, Juan from the, from the uh, chat room wants to know um, about how Bitcoins will deal with internet failure. What does that mean? Poorly. <laughs> yeah. You see, yeah, I made a thread about that, and what will happen is if, big, if the, our total inter internet infrastructure disappears, mm -hmm. um, we'll just have to be reduced to local blockchains, local, uh, local Bitcoins. I made a thread about it, so go on, I'm sorry. <laughs> so what you're saying is, I mean, well, if that would be like, what, if the, in if the entire internet was obliterated? Yeah, yeah. So it's, it, go ahead. If the main infrastructure, the internet is actually very volatile in its infrastructure. The, the government set it up from the beginning, the setting up all the lines and everything else. Mm -hmm. So they could very well go in and cut the lines and divide our internet to pieces or whatever it takes to disrupt the blockchain. And if mm -hmm. that happens, we wouldn't be doomed in terms of decentralized currencies. People will just have to set them up locally on local, uh, possibly firewalled intranets. So, mm. okay. The reality I about distributed systems is that. <laughs> I, um, one of my favorite books, and I really recommend anybody, uh, anybody out there who's looking to understand what Bitcoin means and what it's about, uh, it's a book called The Starfish and the Spider, uh, The Unstoppable Power of Leaderless Organizations. Are you familiar with this, Bruce? No. So um, it's a pretty short book, uh, about 200 pages, by uh, Ori Brofman and Rod A. Beckstrom. Um, mm -hmm. And it basically it doesn't talk at all about Bitcoin, but it talks about, it talks about things like... Um, like uh, like the Spanish conquest of, mm -hmm. uh, of the various Native American, uh, both South American and North American tribes, and mm -hmm. where they succeeded and where they failed, and it essentially likens uh, likens decentralized movements to Apaches, uh, with you know where <laughs> I, 
let me start over. Uh, <laughs> basically, when you take something that doesn't have you know, a centralized control mechanism, you know, that doesn't have, as he describes it, uh, Tenochtitlan, which is the, my pronunciation of, the, uh, of one of the uh, Maya's uh, capital cities. Mm -hmm. You know, when the Spanish showed up there initially, they basically walked up to the biggest temple and walked in there and talked to the guy with the biggest headdress and said, give us all your gold or we'll kill you. And they didn't know who he was. Uh, you know, they, they had never seen anybody look like him before dressed in, dressed in that type of armor. And so they, you know, on the off chance that he was a god, gave him all their gold, and then he, two years later, blockaded their city and starved 260,000 people. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay? Okay. So, now, contrast that to 20 years later, when they move up into North America and start taking on the Apaches, and instead of finding one big city, instead they find all of these different camps. And sometimes there were cities. There, in, in the beginning, the Apaches actually did have villages that were built and had, you know, and had semi-permanent structures and things like that. So the Spanish went there and told, you know, and, and started killing people, started mm -hmm. killing the regional leaders. But because each regional leader wasn't important unto himself, it didn't really matter. Because when they would kill one, just another one would stop. It would pop up. If they would, you know, attack uh, attack a town, well, they might kill half the people, but those other people would go off and form a town that was much more harder to find and get a lot more pissed off at them too. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. So they lost that fight. They, they went up against these, these huge, incredibly advanced, organized civilizations that had organized religion and all sorts of command structures. And then they went up against this ragtag bunch of Apaches with a bunch of fucking teepees, and they got their asses kicked. <laughs> okay, wait a minute. I mean, I, I got to interrupt you. What does this have to do with Bitcoin? <laughs> I don't get these, it. Uh, these centralized societies. Like right. Centralized, exactly. centralized yeah. society. The point is, uh, is money, <laughs> money is the tribe. Mm -hmm. We, in Bitcoin, are the Apaches. We are the new Apaches. They okay. cannot kill us. They cannot stop us. They will stop some of us, and there will be examples made. But at the end of the day, they can't do anything without making it much, much worse for themselves. Mm -hmm. Peer-to-peer uh, peer -peer file sharing is an excellent example of this. Look at how many lawsuits and how many, you know, how many people have been fined thousands and thousands of dollars. Ridiculous fine for the, uh, by the... Uh, uh, for uh, downloading music over right. uh, over various you know Kazaa and Emule and stuff like that, or you can even look at uh, you can even look at those browsers and how you know we started off with Napster and then we went to uh, Kazaa and then we went to Kazaa Plus and then we went to eDonkey and then we went to Emule and at each step as they would shut down these companies, the next one would be more decentralized and right. until you get to a, a product like Emule or uTorrent that has nothing, it's a completely right. open source loop. It's the they evolution, the evolution of the of the form of the of the technology until it's complete decentralization. So, okay, let me ask you, what do you, what do you think the likelihood is that the internet could be stopped or even completely isolated from itself? Uh, I think that they've been setting us up for that. I think that that's something that uh, the power to do that didn't used to exist, but uh, now it does, frankly, because in the last six months they passed an internet kill switch bill that essentially gives the president de facto authority to shut down the internet in the event of a, quote, national emergency. Can the, can the president shut down the internet globally? Yeah, yeah they, they, can, they, they, they can go in and shut down the internet for the United States, and that would take a big chunk of it out. Yeah, but it, would, it wouldn't actually, there is, there is internet outside of the United States. It really would only shut down the, the internet, internet in the United States. Outside of the United States, but seriously, <laughs> do you think that if the United States decides that they're pulling off the mask and they're going all hardcore, that mm -hmm. we're not going to see other, uh, other regimes around the world do the same thing? Yeah, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, but we'll figure out other ways to and, bypass and addition, it. Um, it's a central bank Microwave, to control this whole regime. They want like Bitcoin something. gone. They're going to take all the puppet governments and they're going to do it all around the world. If this happens here, it's surely to happen in uh, the European Union and elsewhere. I, I, I guarantee it. If it happens well, here... It already has happened in the European yeah, Union. Yeah, yeah. We already saw internet disruptions, intentional internet disruptions uh, in Europe over, the la over uh, some, of the, uh, some of the protests. You know, and of course we saw it in the Middle East. I mean, good lord. Heck, look right. at China. You know, they have a pretty good, well, not really good censorship, but they're working on it, you know. Well, it's pretty comprehensive <laughs> censorship. I mean, certainly there are ways around it, but that's like saying, okay, well, you know, don't worry about that wooden wall in front of my, you know, garage. It's only a wooden wall. I can drive through it. Mm -hmm. Well, the thing is, the, the, like somebody, I read a quote somewhere that someone said, um, the Internet by its nature views censorship as an error and routes around it. The fact that you know and you can cite all of these cases of censorship is evidence itself that we're very aware of it. Everybody yeah, knows. Yeah, absolutely, but that doesn't stop the men with the guns to go into the, uh, to the IT places, the ISPs, and just taking the hardware out of the source. It doesn't stop that. It, it isn't impossible to do. 
Yeah, right? but this it has be... actually happened in this country. This has, yeah. I mean, you know, like recently in the last oh, yeah. year, that exact thing has happened several times. Uh, ICE does, uh, sorry, Immigrations and Custom Enforcement mm -hmm. um, does uh, broad scale raids on on ISPs mm -hmm. and shuts down entire entire servers, entire you know, entire buildings, and takes all of the equipment with all of the server yeah. information on it. That's happened three or four times so far. I think they've shut down a couple thousand sites. Right, but in order to shut down the entire internet, basically the world global government would have to confiscate all the computers and all the smartphones and all of the, basically, you know, destroy all ability to generate electricity. I mean, I, I don't know how I'm not it could... saying it's likely, but given <clears throat> the wouldn't... choice between an abandonment of the U.S. dollar or a competing currency, uh, you know, or something as similarly bad to Bitcoin, mm -hmm. don't you think that that would be preferable in the yeah. eyes of the government? Don't underestimate no. the central bank. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> no, I, I don't think I don't see that as likely at all. I don't think no. the government can afford to destroy the entire civilization uh, of humanity just no. to protect the, the dollar. It was US a dollar. lot easier to govern before the internet existed. I mean, uh, do, you, do you deny that? I mean, look at look at. Okay, so you agree that basically the mainstream media there's there's a lot of control, a lot of censorship there, right? Yes. Right. Yep. Okay. Everybody knows that. So, yeah. Okay. So then, doesn't it seem like the internet is more trouble than it's worth? I mean, well, you know, we can move on to another topic from this, but, but the reality is, is that, okay, so getting back to the, to the actual Bitcoin part, uh, if the internet were to be completely destroyed, then Bitcoin would cease to function as a currency, it would cease to function in any sort of meaningful way. Atlas is technically right, you could do it offline, but that would be, that would take away almost all of the advantages of Bitcoin. Right. You know, which is, which is uh, the biggest one, I think, is the ease of use. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I just well, I don't another know. thing is that it's not the governments that would stop uh, Bitcoin through uh, it's a central banks and they are the biggest benefactors from our currencies and and mm -hmm. they have the wealth to do massive things such as destroying internet infrastructure and replacing it with a more authoritarian uh, com uh, network. Mm -hmm. It's easy to have wealth when you print the money. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, I, I maybe I'm an optimist, uh, but yeah, I too. don't see that. I think. I, I, I see Bruce, that in virtual zero percent probability. History on this stuff because you'll see that conspiracy theories, mm -hmm. you know, they're they're re people are real down on them right now. But conspiracies are how the world changes. Well, of course, I do believe. I mean, every, everything is a conspiracy. If two people agree on something, then obviously it's a conspiracy. But I, I think the likelihood of being able to stop the internet at this point and it, and, and suddenly record stores show up in the mall is, is almost zero. And I, I hate to yeah, end on that point, wrong. but I think this is the out. most likely scenario. I'm just saying there are there are scenarios where this is the thing that makes the most sense. Yeah. If there's one thing you can count about centralized control, they're going to go with the you know with the path of least resistance that that accomplishes the most power for them. That's gotcha. what's going to happen. Okay, and I hate to end it on that point, but we're completely out of time. <laughs> we're going to have to pick this conversation up again, obviously. we got a lot to say. I told you. Yeah. So thanks for joining us. I didn't get my two cents. <laughs> we'll see you tomorrow again at 2 p.m. Thanks Eastern time. Stay tuned. Thank we'll see you. you tomorrow. Thanks for joining Talk us. Talk to you later. All right, bye-bye.